Welcome back everybody, and this will be our finale video for Topic 10.10, .10. kind of wrapping up, for the most part, all of Unit 10A about series convergence. And we're going to be talking again about this alternating series error bound. Sometimes students have a little bit of trouble with this on the AP exam. It, it's something that you can probably manage to handle pretty well if you just get the core kind of piece of the concept down pat, which really comes in the form of what we have in our theorem here, theorem 1010. We introduced this when we got talking about our example one. So in a nutshell, I'm not going to read the whole uh, theorem to you again, but basically all that we can do with an alternating series and hoping to add it completely up is to say we got to stop at some point and we're going to stop at this s sub nth partial sum. Well, we do know that if you subtract s and s sub n in whatever order that you want, we don't really care. That's why we put the absolute values around it. That's going to be the difference between your approximated sum Sn and the actual sum S. And we call that the remainder. It's like what's left over. Sometimes that remainder is referred to as error. And again, we put him in absolute values because we know he's going to be positive because of the, the, the difference is all that we're interested in. Well, the key thing about this particular theorem is the fact that that remainder is always going to be less than the positive value of that very next term that you never got a chance to add a sub n plus 1. And so we're going to use this to answer uh, some of these questions that you see here in the example 2. Determine the number of terms required to approximate the sum of the given convergent series with an error less than 1 over 1,000, 0 0.001. And that's important because you want to think of that decimal as being a fraction here in just a moment. So our part A looks like we have an alternating uh, sort of a p type series in this particular instance okay so well, what do we do well one of the things that i really like for my students to do it's not necessarily going to award or penalize points but if i can get you to start writing the absolute value of s minus s n equals the absolute value of r sub n is less than or equal to the absolute value of a sub n plus 1, and then toss in this less than the decimal error, what that's going to do is it's going to facilitate your ability to memorize the conclusion of this theorem. Just by practicing that for a few of the problems in the skill builder, you'll have it down pat. All right, now what we can do is focus on the a sub n plus plus one. That's really what we're asking us to do here. So what we're going to do in this case is focus on the a sub n plus one by determining what is a sub n plus one. Well, the absolute value of this a sub n plus one is nothing more than the absolute value of, we go into this expression and we're going to change the n's to n plus one. So we have negative one raised to the n plus one plus one which would be n plus 2, and all that is divided by n plus 1 quantity squared. Now when you look at this, it doesn't really dictate is this power even or odd, because we don't know what n is. But it really doesn't matter, right? Because these absolute values will obliterate any negative 1 to the odd power, that's going to be negative. And so basically what you've got is just a simplified version, just one over n plus one squared. You really want to get rid of that absolute value in that alternating component because it's going to be much easier to work with. Now I'm going to suggest at this stage, you want that decimal value to be written as a fraction. It's going to make our lives so much easier because I'm going to teach you a little trick here. Yes, of course, you could cross multiply, and that's perfectly fine. But another way to think about it is you could just flip the left fraction, flip the right fraction, basically taking the reciprocal of both sides. 
However, if you do it this way, you also have to flip the sign upside down. All right? It kind of makes sense, right? Two thirds is less than, let's say, five halves. If we flip two thirds upside down and two fifths upside down, then obviously we have to flip the fraction upside down, or the inequality, I should say, upside down, in order for that sentence to make sense. Now, again, you could have cross multiplied, but I always like this end to be on the left side. That's just kind of my personal take on it. All right, now slowly progress through the solution for this. Start by taking the square root of both sides, and you can take the principal square root. You do not need to take plus or minuses into consideration because we're really looking for that positive upper bound, right? N's not going to be a negative number in this particular instance. Now, the problem is right now we don't really know what the square root of 1,000 is. At least I don't know what it is, but that's okay because we could resort to a calculator here in just just a moment. And so eventually we get, say, the square root of 1,000 minus 1 outside of the square root once we um, actually go ahead and subtract the 1. Now I'm not going to go to a calculator application because I'm pretty sure that you can all type in the square root of 1,000 into a calculator and get a decimal answer for it. And what you end up getting is, I believe, 31 and some change, 31.6. But by the time you subtract this 1, you actually get 30.6227, and it does keep going. Now, you're not quite there just yet. And the reason you're not quite there just yet is because I want the value for n. I want to know what term would I arrive at so that I know that this convergence is going to be within 1 1,000th of the actual sum. And so basically you just look at this sentence and you just take the very next integer for which it's true. And that would be 31. Now it's really important to understand. If we went to a 32nd term or a 33rd term, oh, there's no question that our error is going to be less than a thousandth, uh, one one thousandth. It's going to be even better. But basically, I wanted to know what is the smallest n for which this is first going to be true. And that's the way that you would interpret this. Okay? All right. Same thing. Part B. So I'll, I'll bypass writing that um, expression that I wrote on the first line just to get you to practice that, that um, syntax here. And we'll go straight to the last part. So we're going to focus on what is this nth plus 1 term's absolute value. And that would be the absolute value of negative 1 to the n plus 1 over 2 to the n plus 1 times n plus 1 factorial, which of course to us means we can get rid of the alternating component. And really we just have 1 over 2 to the n plus 1 power times n plus 1 factorial. And this is what we are hoping to be less than 1 over 1,000. There is a lot more going on with this problem, as you can see. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and flip both sides. So the left side becomes 2 to the nth plus 1 times n plus 1 factorial. And remember, this right side is going to just be a regular 1,000. And don't forget, you got to flip that inequality sign. If you don't flip the inequality sign, it probably won't make sense because then you're looking for an n that's less than. And it's just going the wrong direction. Now. I don't want you to bother yourself with trying to figure out some algebraic means by which to find n, because you can't. We've talked about how factorials, really, they don't play nicely with calculus, but they also don't play very nicely with algebra sometimes. So you're not going to really be able to solve anything here per se. So what you're going to want to do here is just experiment, trial and error. And I know this might seem a little bit mundane and archaic, but you just start picking some values for n until you get a true statement. And what I would suggest is that you, you try to pick two consecutive ends 
where one is true and the one is false and then you know you've stumbled across your answer. Now I don't think n equaling 1 is going to get us there. n equal 2 is probably not big enough. n equal 3, I don't know. Maybe let's play around with it. So if n is equal to 3, we've got 2 to the 3 plus 1, which is 4, times 3 plus 1 factorial, which is 4 factorial. And I'm questioning, what is that? Well, this is going to end up being 16 times 24. Now, if this is a calculator-assisted problem, then of course you could probably type that in and figure out what's happening. Um, if it's not, uh, the, you've seen worse things in your life. You could multiply these out by hand. It turns out that we're a little shy, right? We're at 384, which unfortunately is not greater than or equal to 1,000, so we can just put the slash through there. So we just go on to our next possibility, say n equal 4. And so that would be 2 to the 5th times 5 factorial, which I believe is going to be 120. And of course, 2 to the 5th is 32. Now by this time, I think you can logically see without multiplying it out that 32 times 120 uh, is certainly bigger than 1,000 because 100 times 5 is 1,000. Um, if you're wondering, this is actually 3,840, which is kind of interesting. It's a multiple of 10 more than what we had before. Just kind of kind of thought that was interesting. And then this is greater than 1,000 for sure. So what that means is by the time we get to n equal 4, we have the term that we need. And so if we were to add the first four terms, find the fourth partial sum, that would give us our value that adds up to something that's less than a thousandth away of what the infinite sum is. So n is equal to 4. All right. There are a few other problem types that you're going to see. You know me. I don't like to give away every kind of question that I could uh, possibly conjure up using this idea. I want you to apply some of this knowledge. Um, this skill builder is certainly one that you don't want to skip. It's not a very long skill builder, so certainly work through these, practice these techniques, really get to know this theorem really well, and it's very likely that on the AP exam, you could actually get a very elusive point on a free response question that a lot of kids across the country may end up missing. It's really not that hard if you practice. Anyway, hope this helps. We'll see you next time.